Welcome back to the course in nuclear medicine physics. Today, we're taking a look at the standard uptake value, which is typically used for quantitation in SPECT and PET imaging. Now, the standard uptake value will be different at every location inside your patient. It's related to the local concentration of the radionuclide inside the patient, but it's also weighted by how much activity you put into the patient in the first place, and also the relative mass of that little local region that you're looking at. In that sense, it's almost like a density. We can compare standard uptake values at different locations in the body to see which areas of the body are most metabolically active. Now, what's most often done is that you have standard uptake value everywhere, and you look at a region and you take the average of all the standard uptake values in a particular region. And that tells you something about a particular organ or a particular tumor in the body. This gives you quantitative or numerical information about how metabolically active one region of the body is compared to another. Anyways, enjoy. All right, so let us talk about the all prevalent concept of standard uptake value. This has been particularly popular in PET imaging, um, but also increasingly in SPECT, it has been used. Um, so it is, a, it is very important to, uh, to understand what the SUV is. And I wanna especially acknowledge my colleagues, Drs. Lodge, uh, Dr. Malawi and Dr. O, who have uh, uh, assisted me in the past with providing graciously sharing slides and I'm making uh, use of some of them. So um, there are limitations with visual assessment. Of course, visual assessment is, is extremely powerful, extremely uh, uh, common. Um, but the, the question is, can we add, um, can we find techniques to add value on top of visual assessment? Uh, it may not be optimal, for example, for assessing subtle changes. Um, so uh, this means, for example, um, when you're, for example, evaluating partial uh, response uh, to, let's say, whether a tumor is, you know, when a tumor is presenting at follow-up, but uptake has been reduced, and also uh, uh, small you know, evaluate small early changes in tumor uptake uh, before uh, full treatment. So, you know, as you're tracking a tumor and you're looking at, for example, possibly subtle changes in a tumor, uh, quantitation perhaps can add value there. Uh, another issue or challenge with purely visual assessment is that, well, it's subjective and therefore you could have variability between, between readers. Um, and clinical trials may require and do require sort of consistent analysis of data from multiple sites. So there might be some added value there for quantitative analysis. Uh, and also visual assessment inherently is non-quantitative um, and, you know, numbers uh, provide strong evidence of uh, treatment effectiveness. So, this is not talking about necessarily replacing visual assessment, but you know, can we add value to visual assessment? Um, so quantitation or quantification, um, we've talked about this before that both PET and SPECT are quantitative. Again, which we've talked about in this sets of classes that there used to be this, or there perhaps continues to be a perception that SPECT is not quantitative, but SPECT has and can become quantitative, and we've talked about it. If all the previously described corrections that we've talked about in these lectures for SPECT and PET imaging are applied, the reconstructed image voxel intensity will be directly proportional to the amount of radioactivity in a given voxel, right? And so, for example, by scanning uniform cylindrical source of known activity, we can come up with a calibration factor that can convert the voxel intensities for that particular scanner and that particular reconstruction algorithm or that particular protocol uh, to, uh, to numbers, quantitative numbers that really represent, you know, the, the, the numbers in the image itself, for example, in units of kilobecquerels per cc or 
per, per milliliter. Um, so here's just an example before we actually tell you what the, how the SUV is defined. So just an example in PET imaging where you are looking at um, FDG PET images of a patient undergoing radiotherapy for head and neck cancer. And you see the background value, you, you know, drawing a region of interest here, the background value is around uh, the standard uptake value on average here, the mean standard uptake value is around one. That's what we want it to be. You know, we, we like the standard uptake value to be of the order of one in the background region so that um, numbers that are significantly higher than that um, represent significant uptake. So here you see that in, in this segmented tumor, the mean SUV value is 9.3, but as uh, therapy happens, for example, this is three months after therapy or six months after therapy, uh, it's nice to see that SUV numbers have gone down significantly. All right, so, so this represents some kind of response to therapy. Um, and it, it has been shown that SUV measure, measures can uh, provide some prediction of clinical outcome. Um, and they can put a, potentially provide an indication of treatment effectiveness as a, 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 at an early stage. So here again, we're seeing that this therapy appears to be working. So how is the standard uptake value defined? This is roughly the formula that has been used um, with, with the definitions presented here. Uh, so C is that quantitative number, the local quantitative activity concentration, let's say in units of kilobecrons per, per ml. And again, this could mean PET imaging and it has been uh, commonly uh, done in PET, but also it can be done in SPECT and it has been done increasingly inspect. A is the injected radioactivity. Uh, as you, for example, quantify a measure in a dose calibrator. And notice that um, A has to be decay corrected from the time you measure it on the dose calibrator, calibrator to the scan start time because it, the concentration in your image itself is decay corrected in the reconstruction to the beginning of the scan. And therefore this injected radioactivity as you measure on the dose calibrator has to be scaled to the beginning of the scan. So you're talking about the same uh, time reference. Uh, and finally, there is this M, this normalization factor. And we're gonna give you some intuition behind this in a second, but this normalization factor reflects, um, re reflects how this injected radioactivity is supposed to be distributed, right? So, um, so it could be the body mass. It could be the body mass. Um, it may also be the lean body mass, okay? So why do we consider the lean body mass instead? Um, because um, it's less dependent on, on variable body habitus across patients. Um, in, you know, there were studies noticing that patients who are more obese their background SUV values are different, uh, in fact, higher uh, than, than patients who are not obese. And then, and then uh, these are just normal uptake values. They're supposed to be the same. And, you know, the reason behind that is, is that, you know, the fat complicates the issue because the tracer uh, uh, has higher uptake typically in the lean body mass as opposed to fat so you can sort of think that, you know, so when you use this instead as the entire volume that can take uptake, you know, it, it might change numbers. So we have a question whether we are always to compute the background ROI SUV mean um, and how important it is to have that as a reference. Um, it is not always done, but it has become increasingly important and recommended to do it, especially if you have a reference region like the liver, for example. And you will see this uh, when we talk later in this talk about uh, uh, response assessment in PET using SUV. Taking the liver, for example, as a reference region kind of helps um, as a reference um, when, when you're comparing. Um, so yeah, so 
increasingly, you know, in, in quantitative analysis, especially for, for response assessment, it's been used. So what is the intuition um, behind SUV? Let's just take this formula here. The normalization here, we're just going to take the patient weight keep it, to keep it simple. So this is the activity concentration. Let's say in, in, in whatever units here is, for example, units, kilobecquerels per ml. And here is the injected dose, and here's a patient weight. Notice that, just think of a uniform cylinder of optic. Um, if it uniformly distributes everywhere, if everything is normal optic, this number, as you see in this formula, becomes one. Take a look at it, because the entire radioactivity distributes around the entire volume equally, and so this ratio is the same as this concentration. Noticing that, uh, one milliliters, one cc is one gram, thinking about water, right? Um, so, so roughly, this formula kind of here is designed so that if you have uniform distribution throughout the, the volume of interest or the entire volume that you're considering, this number should be around one. So that's why the background uptake should be around one in, when you use such a formula here. Um, and you know, let's, let's look at this to get more intuition. Imagine you've got two different vo volumes, uh, uniform uptakes cylinders, but different volumes. And imagine that you've got the same radioactivity being injected. Well, because this is a larger volume, there's gonna be lower concentration here because the one millicure is, for example, being distributed in a larger volume, but you still want the SUV to be one because again, this is all normal uptake. This is, just background normal uptake, and it does become one. Because even though here the, the volume is, and the weight and the volume is larger, but also the concentration is lower, and these things cancel out and numbers become one. Another example is if you're injecting higher radioactivity, but let's say in the same volume, well, sure, you're gonna get higher concentration. In this example, twice as high concentration. But also in this formula, this ratio is gonna be twice as higher because the injected dose is double. So again, these two cancel out and you get an SUV of one for both of these. So, so SUV is intended so that if you're injecting the same patient, for example, with different injected amounts, you're not supposed to get different SUV values. Um, or if you've got two patients with the exact same condition, but one of them is, uh, uh, one of them uh, has a, has a uh, higher body weight, well, you're supposed to do it in a way that it kind of normalizes. So that SUV of around one, for example, makes sense. Okay, so there are a number of factors affecting SUV. There's been a lot of studies here, surprising findings of inconsistencies between centers. So this is something that there's been, you know, groups of people and, and collaborations formed to make sure that SUVs that different centers and scanners are getting are becoming more and more consistent because people had noticed and continue to notice inconsistencies. So there have been significant efforts to, to make SUV a little bit, to understand at least SUV more, to understand why it varies, and also to try to control it and make it more consistent across different scanners um, uh, and different centers. So there are a number of things we have got to do right for SUV. There are a number of factors we can, uh, uh, we can do to minimize uh, you know, variability, or the, we can minimize the factors themselves with careful quality assurance so that the SUV variability is, is reduced. There are a number of factors we can minimize and control with consistent protocols, factors over which we have some limited control and factors over which we have no control. So let's talk about some examples here. So here, you know, it's things that we just have to do right and uh, is to make sure that clocks are synchronized, right? As we said, you're doing decay correction, for example, from the dose calibrator to the scan start time. So everything has to make sense. The clocks have to make sense. You're obviously entering things correctly. You're, you know, when you're scanning FDG, you're saying this is F18. This is not like carbon 11. So the decay corrections are being done, right? Um, the uh, measurement time, times, you know, have to be right. The weight has to be properly measured. Remember, SUV uses weight. Also the height, because when you use the lean body mass correction for SUV, um, it, it turns out that um, you know, to, to measure lean body mass, there are different formulas for it, but they do make use of both weight and height to calculate the lean, lean body mass, for example. Um, measuring things like residual activity correctly, and just generally quality of injections, right? And 
Some factors that we can minimize with careful QA uh, is, you know, making sure that those calibrators are stable over time. The scanners are st stable over time, proper quality assurance, and there's proper uh, cross calibration of scanner and those calibrators. Things that we can minimize with consistent protocols, patient preparation, you know, obviously, you know, scanning patients that have, you know, making sure the patients have followed proper protocols, for example, proper fasting when they're doing an FTG scan. Um, you know, you're having consistent uptake periods. If, for example, the time between your injection uh, to scan is 60 minutes, you try to keep it pretty consistent at 60 minutes. Otherwise, if you've got a, a patient before therapy and after therapy, but before therapy, they waited 60 minutes in the, in, in the uh, waiting room and in the uh, post-therapy scan, they waited 90 minutes in the, in the uh, 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 patient waiting room. Well, you've given them more time, so they, they might actually, they will get higher, relatively higher SUV values. And you might think, oh, the tumor is getting worse if you're just looking at the numbers. But that's just because they waited more in the patient waiting room, there was more time for, for, for uptake. And also definition of the regions of interest. We'll talk about this in a second. Factors over which we have only limited control are things like patient motion. We could try to make sure the patients are comfortable, um, try to minimize some movements, but there are things that we just don't have too much control over, right? Respiratory motion, for example. You know, cardiac motion itself, thankfully, is, is not an issue except for cardiac imaging because, you know, the heart is in a sack and as the heart beats, you know, that sack is pretty stable, so it doesn't impact the rest of the areas of the body. But respiratory, the respiratory motion itself uh, is obviously there. And image noise, right? So which protocol do you use uh, to do the reconstruction, to, to, to control noise, you know, how much are you injecting? Even though I, I mentioned to you that, you know, SUV is supposed to be correcting for injected activity, but obviously if your injected activity is too low, the image is gonna be too noisy. And if they're too noisy, then dry, you know, identifying regions of interest might be more challenging. And noise, you know, might make, does make SUV values uh, less reliable because they oscillate and they're not as repeatable. Uh, um, so paying attention, attention to this is important. And finally, there are factors, you know, there's this factor over which you have no control, real biological variability. If you scan a patient today and then bring that same patient tomorrow and scan that patient, there's gonna be some biological variability in the same patient day to day, right? So if it, when you do test retest studies, just to understand how reliable the SUV values are, and we're gonna talk about this, there is you know, two contributions. One is just noise uh, from the scanner, because you, you know, you're gonna get different noise realizations, but also biological variability, day to day biological variability in the same patient. And there's no control that we, we can have really over that. So let's talk about one of these factors, ROI definition, which is quite important, the region of interest definition, because it has a strong influence on SUV, uh, on how accurate the numbers and on how reliable, reproducible they are. Um, so here are, for example, just some examples, right? So if you just draw uh, just a box around the tumor, this is not an exact delineation of the tumor, just a box around it. Uh, and you just look for the hottest voxel in there, that's ROI max. And the SUV that you measure in that hottest voxel is called SUV max. It's a very simple measure. That's why it's so popular in the clinic, SUV max. You don't even need to segment the tumor, just identify where the tumor is and just find the hottest voxel in there. Um, but you could segment and there are different ways to segment. You may do manual segmentation. You may do more of a uh, software based uh, uh, segmentation. It doesn't have to be this technique that I mentioned here. It could be any technique. There's a lot of efforts nowadays using AI-based methods. But the point is different segmentation methods are going to give you different regions of interest, right? Um, and when you calculate the mean uptake here, let's call it SUV mean, and the mean uptake here, obviously these are going to be different. So segmentation does make a difference, right? Segmentation does make a difference um, to uh, the measured values, right? And finally, there's this thing we call ROI peak, where you take a um, spherical volume that is one milliliter, one cc, and you just move it around this area until the uh, average uptake in it is maximized. So that's ROI peak. So here, for example, the value might be maximized. We're gonna see this again, but the measurement here we have is called SUV peak.
Okay. So again, so this one is is as you can see is is, is kind of objective, right? It, it, the hottest voxel is the hottest voxel. It's very easy to measure, but you can imagine that just focusing on a single pixel or voxel could be noisy. Could give give us noisy values here, right? Manual or segmentation methods uh, could have their own issues. Manual could be uh, uh, very subjective. It is also very time consuming. That's why routinely in the clinic, this is not done. Um, software methods are more objective, but there have been challenges in getting accurate and reliable segmentations. There are a lot of efforts nowadays to do this using artificial intelligence methods, uh, for example. And PRI again, you don't need to do segmentation. You just need to know where the tumor is and you move this one CC sphere around until its value is maximized, okay? Uh, um, so, and the hope was and is that it might be a, at least a bit more robust with respect to noise because you're not just looking at one pixel, but you're looking at a collection of pixels. Okay, so again, just, just an example here. Uh, we've got a large tumor and here's the hottest pixel. So that's SUV max. But when you do SUV peak, it might be here. And notice that SUV peak doesn't have to be centered around where the SUV max is. It doesn't even have to contain SUV max as in this example. Sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't, right? So these are two different ways to measure SUV, and obviously these will impact your numbers. Um, here's a really good paper by my um, colleague, uh, Dr. Martin Lodge at Johns Hopkins, I recommend you take a look at this if you're interested in repeatability, test re test repeatability, repeatability of SCB values in oncologic FTG PET imaging. You know, if I do a scan today and tomorrow or within a few days on the same patient, how reliable are my, are my numbers? You really want to get the same numbers because within a few days, the patient shouldn't have changed. There have been, no, you know, you make sure that those studies, no, no therapy has happened between those two scans. They just test, retest studies to study how stable, how reliable the numbers are. So how, how reliable are the numbers? And he reviews the literature from many different papers and sort of comes up with typical numbers. This is for SUV max, SUV mean, and SUV peak. Um, and this is so-called, you know, each of these papers might do measurements differently, but then he brings them all to the same uh, metric, which is in this case within subject coefficient of variability. So in a given subject, how variable is uh, the, the uptake? And again, these numbers, you, you, would, you would like it to not change at all. You like this number to be 0% because again, these are test retest studies, but it's not 0% for mainly two reasons. One, one is, I mean, we talked about um, a host of things that, that, that can change SUV. Obviously, these things you've got to do right, and you like to make these very consistently. But even if you do all of these very, very consistently, right, these kind of things remain. You know, especially the effect of noise remains. Between two protocols, you have different, between two, even same reconstructions on the same subject, but two different scans, you're going to have different noise realizations, for example. Uh, there might be subtle changes because of different motion patterns, right? Um, and real biological variability in the uptake, right? So, so there's going to be contributions from this area, let's say, you know, different noise realizations and also from biological variability between the patients, between the same patient uh, uh, in two different scans. And you see the numbers are around 10%. SUV max is, appears to have a bit higher uh, variability, as you would expect, because it's just a single pixel, it is noisy. You would have liked to see SUV peak to be quite better than SUV max. He doesn't find it to be that much better, right? I mean, it is better, but it's not that much better, at least in this study that has put everything together, right? Uh, and also SUV mean, you would have expected this to be even better than SUV peak because you're looking at even a larger region, you're looking at an entire tumor. But the reason these have not been entirely uh, uh, reliable perhaps in the past is because, you, I, I, as we said, you need to do segmentation and segmentation may not be very robust. So the hope is these numbers will improve over time as you have better and better segmentation methods that give, give you more objective, more reliable, more repeatable segmentation. So these numbers may improve. But let's just focus on SUV max and sort of SUV peak because these two are done increasingly in the clinic. Um, and so the numbers typically are around, let's say 10%, right? Okay, so what does that mean? Well, 
let's define this thing called the 95% limits of repeatability, okay? What does that actually mean? And we'll get that in a second, but you know, how repeatable are the numbers? The within subject uh, variability is this number, within a subject coefficient of variation. You actually have to multiply this by square root of two because you're talking about differences between two scans. So if the variability of a random variable A is a number, the variability of A minus B, the difference between the two scans is going to be increased by a factor, it turns out to be increased by a factor of square root of two. And this 1.96, you may remember this, uh, but this is when you have a standard uh, deviation, you multiply the standard deviation by this number, for example, in a Gaussian, and that gives you 95% coverage of the Gaussian. What does this really mean? Just, just hang in there with me. What this means is that, okay, so by the way, put a number 10% here, which is what his study of the literature shows, around 10%. If the within subject coefficient variability of SUV is about 10%, you multiply it by these numbers, you get about 28%. So what does that mean? It means, what does this mean? It means that an SUV derived from two separate studies, let's say back to back, you know, day one, day two, they're supposed to be very similar. But what we have learned is that the numbers are expected to differ by up to 28% for 95% of observations. So if you're studying the same subject under the same conditions, right? The only change being, you know, things like noise and biological variability, but not like things like therapy and real change in the tumors, for example. The, in 95% of the observations, um, you're going to have, um, are going to be within 28%. Okay. So what does that mean? So if I have a patient before therapy and the patient comes back after therapy and the SUV has decreased by 15%. Does that mean that this is a real change in the tumor? What do you think? Do you think, yes or no, do you think that this means if the number SUV value has decreased by 15% after therapy, does this mean that the therapy is working? Yes or no? You guys can type here in the, in the chat. Do you think the therapy is working if the SUV value has changed by 15%? Yeah, so, so we have one answer. You guys can enter more, yes or no? Right, so answers are coming in, right? So, so people are saying no, and that's correct. Because that 15% may not be a real um, change. It just might be because of this uh, repeatability issues. Right? So it's only when the change is more than, and let's, instead of 28%, let's just say 30%. Only if the change is more than 30%, we can be, you know, more certain given this 95% limits of repeatability that this is real change. Okay? So that's a very important thing. And this limit is now in close agreement with the 30% criterion that was re recommended for response assessment. And we will see this in a second. So let's talk about this. You know, there have been, um, you know, how do, we, how do we evaluate, quantitatively evaluate whether a therapy is, for example, working, whether a patient is responding to therapy, so response assessment criteria. So here's a, just an older recommendation, one of the early generation recommendations by the European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer. Um, Yeah, so, 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 so in, in this particular kind of response criteria, you, you saw certain recommendations, things like saying, okay, this is a complete response, partial response, stable disease, and uh, progressive metabolic disease. So notice that they were saying originally that if after one cycle of therapy, you see 15% decline in SUV, maybe you are having a partial response. But we just challenged that, right? And in fact, it's exactly because of these recommendations that these numbers have changed in other response criteria. Um, so there were some limitations with this kind of earlier response criteria, but specifically this 15% was, for example, a, a problem. There are other issues too with, they didn't, like they didn't necessarily recommend how to handle multiple lesions and things of the sort. Um, 
And then there comes this very popular publications and recommendations called Persist uh, that has been implemented on a wide range of vendors, uh, very popularly uh, implemented. So positron emission response criterion solid tumors. So this is Persist criterion PET imaging. Um, and so, so moving from the, the you know, other kinds of CT-based criteria to say, wait a minute, a PET should really be used for assessment of um, response to therapy, looking at metabolic uptake and functional uptake, et cetera. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of details. So, so I, I recommend you look at this, this, this uh, uh, very large publications and it, this highly impactful publication. Um, you know, how do you, what is measurable tar target lesion, for example? And this is a question we had earlier. Do you always measure SUV in the background? But you see in this example, first of all, they're talking about SUL. L is the uh, lean body mass correction factor. And they're saying, you know, we're, we're going to pay attention, especially to tumors that are above a certain threshold. And that threshold they do with respect to uh, SUV uptake. Uh, in the liver. So the liver becomes kind of like your reference. And if you're higher than the liver by a certain, you know, factor and standard deviations being measured as a measure of noise in the liver, if you're above it by a certain amount, then that gives you some kind of measurable target lesions. So you focus on those lesions. So, but I'm not going to go through those details, but I, what I really do want to show you are, is these, this number 30%. So different response criteria, um, so complete metabolic response, partial metabolic response, stable metabolic disease, and progressive metabolic uh, disease. But notice again, this number has not really changed. And the focus, by the way, th their recommendation was on lean body mass corrected SUVs and then focusing on peak measurements. Um, again, this, this was sort of a, you know, persist 1.0, you know, the initial recommendations, right? And yeah, these are for solid tumors. But of course, people are talking about, you know, non-solid tumors and what kind of um, recommendations do we have for that? But the focus here was uh, for, for solid tumors. So, um, so, yeah, so those are numbers. Um, is that enough? And there have been a number of very good commentaries saying that persist is not enough because persist focuses on SUVs. It, 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 it certainly was a move towards quantitative imaging, but there are, you know, we shouldn't stop there, right? So there are techniques that allow us to move beyond SUV only measures. I'm gonna talk about three uh, prominent uh, candidates. One is to do kinetic modeling. One is to also bring in volumetric measures and also focusing on radiomics. Um, so kinetic modeling, we're not gonna talk about that today. Um, it's, it's a tremendously important area. It's always been there uh, in uh, PET imaging. It's been there, you know, for decades. Uh, and in fact, this is sort of the ultimate, you know, gold standard uh, imaging yeah, in PET. And it can be done in, in SPEC too, but it's been uh, done a lot more in PET imaging. So how do we relate quantitative images, let's say in these units that we've been talking to, to actually meaningful, physiologically meaningful parameters? This is just a quantitative number that tells you how much uptake is in a certain pixel. But how do we relate that to physiologically meaningful parameters? Like how much is the blood flow in this myocardial perfusion imaging? Not the uptake, but the blood flow. How much is the uh, binding potential, for example, in neuroreceptor imaging and other kinds of receptor imaging? How much is the rate of metabolism, for example, as you do in FDG imaging? What, you know, how do you measure those? And the answer is using kinetic modeling techniques. Um, and in reference to that, that's why you hear that SUV is considered semi-quantitative in the sense that SUV does make a number of simplifications and it is a pseudo estimate for these physiologically meaningful parameters. And again, in, in early studies, people tr tried to correlate SUV with these kind of kinetic-based uh, parameters, kinetic modeling-based parameters, and showed there are some good correlations in some studies. That's why people felt comfortable switching to SUV. But there's been awareness and increasing awareness and recognition that these are not the same. And this is semi-quantitative and kinetic modeling-based measures are the ultimate you know, uh, reference. Um, 
So w- w- what do they actually do? So to explain that, let me first ex- you know, look at this diagram together. This is, uh, this is not kinetic mind. This is just image reconstruction, which we've talked about in this course. So you've got, um, uh, you've got the radioactivity distribution that's being imaged by your system, your PET system, your spec system, as defined by the physics, and you get some data. The job of an image reconstruction is to take this measured data and the physics of the scanner and reconstruct the radioactivity distribution. So that's the image reconstruction. It has nothing to do with kinetic, or it's not kinetic modeling. But kinetic modeling is also another kind of reconstruction problem, though it's not called that way. But here you have the system is the body, let's say the human body that is being quantified, okay? Not the scanner. It's system here, think of the system as the biological system you're trying to image. The input to it, you can think of it as the, for example, the radio tracer as it is distributing in the blood over time. And let's say you measure this somehow, for example, you measure this by uh, sampling, doing blood samples, or you do it non-invasively by finding a place in your body that has a blood pool, right? Um, and then, uh, for example, in the heart, uh, in the left ventricle or in the atrium, you can put a region of interest in there to look at the blood, and then that gives you how is the radio tracer distributing in the blood over time. And then that radio tracer from the blood is taken up by the biological system, let's say by the human body, and it distributes in tissue over time. This is what the reconstructions give you actually, right? So the reconstructions are telling you how's radio tracer distributing in the body. Let's say you know how, what is the tracer input in the plasma. Here you wanna reconstruct the system. What are the biological parameters? For example, rate of you know, uptake into the tissue and metabolism. So kinetic modeling estimates these using mathematical biology. Again, we won't go through that. Uh, but the challenge with kinetic modeling, one reason it's not used, uh, it's it's not used as dominantly as SUV, is because it commonly involves dynamic imaging. So not just doing a static frame, but you know looking at the same, looking at radio tracer uptake over time. Uh, so it may require, it may require longer scan durations, as used for SUV based imaging, especially like in oncology. So the question becomes out of cost benefit analysis. Is it worth extending the scan times? You know, with you know, increasingly scanners, better and better scanners, you can scan the same patient for SUV in short and shorter durations. Also, you can do very good quality kinetic modeling, but it is it takes longer, for example, in oncological imaging. So is it worth it? And this is why people are looking at this carefully to see. And so there are various software products available for kinetic modeling. This actually is is nowadays easily doable in myocardial perfusion imaging, right? In cardiac imaging, when you're looking at the uh, uh, blood flow estimation, right? Um, it can be done actually in a short, very short duration at the time of injection, a couple of minutes, you could, for example, do this. Um, but in oncological applications, you, you need longer scan time. So is it worth it? And where are cases where this is gonna give us the best benefit? So that's kinetic modeling. Another uh, approach beyond SUV only measures is to do um, volumetric measures. So not just focusing on uptake, but looking at the volume. So for example, if you segment the tumor and just measure the tumor volume, this is called metabolic tumor volume when you do FDG imaging, or more generally using other radio tracers, you could call it molecular tumor volume, like in PSMA PET, for example. But this MTV, and then if you take MTV and multiply it by SUV mean, which is kind of like the integral, it's not just the intensity, it's not just the volume, but the integral of the uh, radioactivity, which is essentially the product of these two, that in FTG imaging is called total lesion glycolysis, for example, right? And so these are more volumetric because they're looking at not just the uptake, but they're looking at the volume of the tumor. And there are studies showing that MTV can be superior. And in some cases, extremely and highly superior to SUV to model prediction of outcome in certain cancers, right? So lymphoma is an example. Uh, in lymphoma, let's say in uh, DLBCL imaging, there are a good number of studies showing that the metabolic tumor volume or the total metabolic tumor volume, where you're, you're summing it up for all the tumors that you're measuring in the body, total you know, tumor burden volumetrically can be a very good predictor of outcome uh, compared to SUV, which may not be a good predictor of outcome at all. So that's why there's been a lot of interest in this. However, the challenge is you need reliable segmentations, 
because that's very time consuming. That's why people don't do it in the clinic because the, the clinician has to spend more time and therefore it's not done in routine practice. But the hope is that with AI-based solutions, for example, using deep neural networks and deep learning, there's significant activity in this area to come up with routine um, segmentation of tumors, routine and reliable segmentation of tumors uh, to allow us to make these measures. So the hope and the vision is that we're not just going to be reporting SUV max, right, for our patients, but we're going to be looking at volumetric measures too. And also we like to move beyond individual metrics. Why just report this or that? Why not combine all these features, uh, for example, using machine learning methods to build better models? Uh, and the point is each metric captures a part of the tumor and it may miss other aspects of it. So again, take a look at SUV max. Here's a tumor and this is the hottest pixel, for example. When you do SUV max, you're essentially dis disregarding everything else in this tumor and just focusing on the hottest pixel. Right in this example that we show, what, what, what you know, but but there's a lot of information in this tumor, a lot of numbers, and and there might be also the shape of this tumor and also the heterogeneity in the uptake. Um, so images are not just pictures; they're data, and this field of radiomics or radiomics tries to 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 think differently, right? Um, so you're extracting a large number of features from radiological images. Again, these features could be handcrafted features like SUV Max, MTV, but also other features, heterogeneity, you know, entropy in the uptake and you know, other kinds of heterogeneity measures, right? They could also be uh, features that are not handcrafted by your, uh, for example, your uh, deep neural network in, in AI extracts them on its own. So whether they're handcrafted features and then combined using machine learning methods or you're using deep learning based methods that kind of you just give it the raw images and it itself extracts the features and combines them. But the point is you're not just focusing on one metric and the radionic features have the potential to, to uncover disease characteristics that fail to be appreciated perhaps by the naked eye. And then again, when you combine them into radionic signatures, um, you could get distinct imaging, you know, these distinct imaging features and signatures might improve diagnosis, prognosis, therapy response assessment, and the hope is that you're gonna to move towards personalized therapy. Um, so you've heard of omics in genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, but again, why not do it also in radiological images, therefore the field, field of radiomics or radiomics. There's been significant activity in this area. Just showing you one example here. Here, here you've got an image it is segmented here. You may extract a lot of features. Again, in this example, these are handcrafted features, lots and lots of them, and you may combine them using machine learning methods and build models that may be able to predict outcome, that may be able to better assess disease, et cetera. So again, these are the hopes and dreams to move beyond SUV-only measures. Uh, to summarize this presentation, there have been efforts to move beyond purely visual assessment of images and SUV was it that allowed us to move purely, uh, beyond purely visual assessment. It has been widely adopted, adopted for PET and increasingly for SPECT. We talked about different kinds of SUV-based metrics, for example, SUV max, peak, mean, um, and the need to understand variability of SUV measures. And, um, we try to link this variability to existing criteria for response assessment. And finally, we talked about um, ideas, or at least three areas where we can move beyond SUV only measures.